Hello, and welcome to the New Schools Podcast. How do we raise successful people? On that subject, Esther Wojcicki, lovingly referred to as the godmother of Silicon Valley, has written the book. Esther is a revered high school teacher who founded the media arts program at Palo Alto High School, now one of the largest in the nation with over 600 students. She was a role model for Silicon Valley legends like Steve Jobs and is the mother of three very successful daughters. One is the CEO of YouTube, another a professor of pediatrics at UCSF Medical School, and the third, a co-founder of 23andMe, the company doing DNA testing and analysis. Her most recent book is the appropriately titled How to Raise Successful People, Simple Lessons for Radical Results. Esther is a distinguished visiting scholar at Media X at Stanford, serves as vice chair of Creative Commons, and has been intimately involved with Google and Google EDU, where she helped create the Google Teacher Academy. She holds two honorary doctorate degrees, was California Teacher of the Year, is a board member of Alliance for Excellent Education in Washington, D.C., and on the board of Museum in D.C. She has been a consultant for the U.S. Department of Education, Hewlett Foundation, Carnegie Foundation for Advancement of Teaching, Silicon Valley Education Foundation, and Time Magazine Education. Esther has worked as a professional journalist for multiple publications, including the Huffington Post, has been a speaker at multiple TEDx events, and now is a speaker here at The New Schools. We're honored and very excited to bring you a little of her wit and wisdom in this conversation and hope you enjoy. Now here's your host, Shannon Falkenstein and Esther Wojcicki. Hello, Esther Wojcicki. Thank you so much for being on the New Schools podcast today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm really excited to talk to everybody in your audience. So thank you. you. Excellent. (laughs) Woo! We're going to have a great time. So I'd love to start out with a really positive question. What is your favorite thing about working with young learners? You never know what you're going to get. The unexpected. Because young learners, they're incredibly creative. And you would never be able to predict what they're going to ask or do or say. And I love that unpredictability and I love their creativity. So, and as they get older, they are much more rule bound, but as teenagers, they're, thank God for the teenage years because they're rebels. And I know the parents have a hard time and, you know, it wasn't easy when my kids were teenagers either, but that's where all the innovation comes from when you don't follow the rules. And as long as you're following the rules, well, you might as well just, you know, there is no change. Yes, I hear you. And that that makes me think about something I've thought about for a long time and remembering back to my own teenagehood is that um, I think teenagers a long time ago were much more burdened with responsibility and much more trusted to do adult things. And then with the industrial model of education, it became like you're saying, where suddenly they were like just supposed to sit in a room passively and listen and learn. And so there was this whole energy that they naturally had to innovate, to create, to make changes. And it was just like tapped down, tamped down um, from the school system. And um, do you, would you agree with that statement? What do you think about that? Yeah, I do think that that's true. That's exactly what happened. Um, so initially kids were given a lot of responsibility and that was at the beginning of the 20th century, but then the culture changed and schooling changed. And the idea was, you know, you want your child to have a better life and the better life seemed to be in the factory model somehow, you know, that you, everybody was standardized. You, when you graduated from high school, you had a standard set of skills and everybody had them. 
And so then the main thing you learn to do is follow instructions. But you have to look at what happened at the beginning of the 20th century. There was a big illiteracy problem. And so the school system did a good job in solving that problem because illiteracy is pretty much gone. You know, we have, I don't know, 90% literacy. And in most parts of the world, we have, a you know, literacy is pretty high. Um, but if you take a look at people in, well, I was just talking to somebody in Portugal who said that if you take a look at the population in Portugal, over 60, the over 60 group, still there's a lot of people in that group that are not literate because that's what was going on at that time. So, um, so then after we went from following directions, which we all did, we then moved into the internet era and, you know, the 20th century because 1999, you know, that was the change, big change, everything's internet. And you can find information by yourself online. You don't have to go to the library. You don't have to sit in a boring lecture. You know, you don't have to ask your great uncle Jack. You know, you can find it yourself. And so one of the no number one skills was how to find it yourself. Search. And that's what I always ended up teaching in my class first. The first thing I taught, how to search, how to find what you want to find online. And there's a book out today written by this guy, Dan Russell, called The Joy of Search. It's a good book. I recommend it. And he has a lot of, I mean, the things you can find online, it's amazing if you know how to look for them. And so I think everybody should have those skills. There, there are two skills that I think everyone should have. That's one. And the second one is how to distinguish fact from opinion. And I think we are not teaching that in the schools. And so a lot of people get conned by all kinds of things. And the question is, what are the propaganda techniques? What techniques do people use in advertising to make you want to buy that widget? Well, they're using the same techniques in news to make you to believe something that isn't true. So if you know all the techniques, then you can be a little bit more aware. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, so if you were, our audience for the podcast is like parents and educators who feel this growing pressure and frustration at the traditional system and are seeking something new and want to innovate, but maybe they don't know how, or they're feeling afraid or anxious about it. So I love that you just mentioned that those are two very key skills that, that all humans need to know right now. What would be, if you were a parent who had your child in traditional school or you were a traditional school educator, how would you make sure that the young people around you were able to learn those two key skills? Well, I've tried to change the schools, and I know that's really almost impossible. But what I've done is I pretty much tried to change a lot of things about the schools. Then I backed up and thought about it and realized that if I just could change a portion of what they're doing, that might be sufficient. So I came up with this philosophy called 20% time. If you just change 20% of the time in a traditional school, and in that 20% time, you give kids an opportunity to be independent, to do things that they want to do, to study things they want to study, to learn to collaborate and to think critically and to communicate, then it's okay. You can still have the 80%, but then kids at least have grow up and have an idea, have the confidence to think, well, maybe I could do something independently on my own. So um, just as this past summer, starting in June, I worked with a group of my students and my former students uh, to set up this company called Tract, T-R-A-C-T dot app. And the goal of this company is to empower kids, to give them the opportunity to learn things they want to learn. It would fit into the 20% time. And so that it would make it easy for teachers to do it. You could just say, go on track. And this is something you can do. Or after school, when your kids have nothing to do and they're driving you crazy, have them do that. You know, and what it is, it's gamified learning. So it's learning that has a game component built into it. And here's the thing that's the most interesting about it. It's by kids. Teenagers creating it for kids that are preteens. 
Wow. And then it's an opportunity for them to meet these. So they get to meet each other. It's peer to peer online project based learning. So it's, you know, I've been trying to change education for a while. And I thought, well, why don't I try this way? I'll I go directly that. to the kids. You <laughs> yeah, know, they're the, ones, they're the ones that are suffering sitting there in your class in a row, you know, and pretty soon the teacher looks at you and you're like, I mean, the kid looks like they're daydreaming. And guess what? They are. <laughs> right. <laughs> And now that school is over Zoom, it's even worse. I oh, it's worse. Oh, my God. Trapped. You know, one of the main problems is that the teacher on Zoom and on Google Meet and on actually all of them, they can mute you, mute the whole audience in one click. Yes. Everybody. And then you, depending, and you can't do anything. You just have to listen. And it's so incredibly boring. So I've been trying to help teachers be a little bit more creative on this. There's a lot of things online to help teachers maybe not work so hard and give kids an opportunity to interact more and use the breakout rooms a little bit more. And, you know, if you don't know how to use a breakout room, Zoom has a lot of instructions online for free. So um, that's one of the things that I think we need to work on is how to make the instruction online more engaging for kids. I cannot um, agree with you more. (laughs) That is so true. I think it is a big challenge for educators right now to learn how to use those, um, to use new technologies in a much more innovative and, and entertaining way, not like we have to entertain the kids, but in a way that's much more engaging and engages more of the senses. Right. And um, AHA does provide those opportunities for interaction, which is the, the most, one of the most important parts, I believe, of the learning experience for youth. So you just mentioned the difficulty. I can, I can see that you've tried many different strategies and many different creative ideas to try to bring about this change in education. You're talking about an app right now, Tracked, and... Um, and I have listened to some of your TED Talks and heard how you, in the beginning at least, were a proponent of working from inside the institution to try to help them change. How has that gone? And um, do, I, I kind of have a metaphor that I use that came from Martha Beck where she talks about how, um, if you can imagine a tsunami wave of change coming and like crashing into the shore. Uh, metaphorically, and that the institutions that we grew up with, you know, in the in the 20th century are like these buildings on the shore, and they're just getting annihilated by the change, right? Like the school system, you know, many other things, the all, industries are getting disrupted and everything. And so if you are stuck in the ground on the shore, you're going to get creamed, you know, but if you can be agile and be out on a surfboard, and get out there before the rogue wave is like coming in that you can actually save yourself because you're able to be agile and like respond to everything. And that's kind of how I've been thinking about it lately is that if you're trying to do it from inside, it's really difficult. You're going to face a lot of resistance and it might end up getting kind of deformed. Whereas if you can do it from, from that surfboard model, you might get more traction. Can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. So I think that trying to do it from the inside is, if not impossible, it's almost impossible. And one of the reasons is because teachers are really implementers of the curriculum determined by the state or determined by the school board. So your job as you are hired is to deliver the curriculum that has been decided by someone else, not you, and make sure that the kids know that. And the way that they evaluate you is by the testing. They test the kids, and if the kids don't do well, you fail. And so teachers are afraid to take a risk. Because, you know, they have lives and they have families and they have other things in there that they have to do. And they're like, you know, I just don't have time to do all this stuff and to try and then fight the administration and fight the school board and, or the government or whatever. 
I mean, there are countries where you actually are on the same page as every other teacher teaching that subject that day. That happens to be France. And like a all script, the you mean? Colonies. Like a daily script that they're following? Uh, the whole thing is spelled out at the beginning of the year. You can see the entire curriculum. That and sounds like you, it's at a risk for being taken over by automation. <laughs> um, actually, it is called scripted learning. Mm -hmm. And so it could be taken over by automation. Pearson um, and some of the other major textbook companies have what is called scripted learning. The t districts can buy that. You buy a book, it comes with online material, it comes with homework and tests, and you just follow the directions. It's like a recipe. It's like making banana bread. Mm -hmm. You know, you just follow the recipe and at the end out comes the product that they want, which is this student that knows this material. And that's because they don't trust the teachers. Right. And this way they can assure that every kid is getting exactly the curriculum that the school or the state has decided that they are going to get. So what is this curriculum? It, it, it could possibly be good. But what it is, is it's 90% memorization. It's not thinking. That's the problem. So like I said, back to my 20% model, if the state and the school want to continue, let them do that 80% of the time. And then 20% of the time, give the kids an opportunity to do things independently, some light. It's kind of like you work five days a week and two days a week, you're free. It's like, so it's, this is just something I came up with. It's based on Google, you know, mm -hmm. since I spent a lot of time at Google and it, the 20% projects at Google did really well. You know, Gmail is a 20% project, for example. Um, so that's what I was trying to figure out. How could we work within the system? Because a lot of people have tried to change the whole system. And it's really hard. It, and it has failed everywhere in the world. Right. So, so even there where you are in Silicon Valley, where you would think that people are really you know, pro-innovation and really see the value in it, you're not seeing those changes happen for the school boards and the government. It's, you know, tradition is very hard to change. Right. It's just, it's kind of like the main, the two groups that won't change in society or haven't changed for 2,000 years. Number one is the church. And number two, the schools. Mm -hmm. Because schools are, their goal of a school is to perpetuate the traditions of society. You're supposed to teach, you know, whatever it is that society deems important. And um, you're not supposed to go off track. You know, so when I was teaching English, English classes, I had specific books that I was required to teach. And in social studies, they hand you the book. Social studies, history. You know, today, in today's world, we realize that history is really written from the perspective of the victor. So if you read the history of Germany in German, you're going to see a very different view of the world than if you read it from America or from France or from England or from, you know, Spain or wherever. And so all these things, kids should be able to think and not just memorize. So that's what I've been trying to do. So I stopped trying to do it from in the system and I started to do it outside the system. And that's been more successful. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I worked on early on, I don't know if you know, is the Google Education, Google Teacher Academy. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Tell us more. So, yeah, I was actually one of the founders. And a lot of my ideas are embedded in all the Google Education products. Oh, great. And so Google Docs, for example, and Sheets and presentations. And if you notice... They're all collaborative. Yes, and I do. I use them Microsoft, every day. <laughs> yeah. Microsoft, no collaboration. They started within the last few years doing 365, which is collaborative. Mm -hmm. But it took them a long time to come to that realization. And, um, and then also, I was one of the founders of the Google Teacher Academy. And that's where you teach teachers how 
to use tools that empower their kids to collaborate. So, um, so that is actually within the system. I was working within the system there, but, and it did work. And, you know, Google tools are like everywhere in the world and they're effective. But I think that to make the significant changes that we need to make, it has to be from without, from out, outside the system. And the silver lining in our pandemic is that it's disrupted the entire education system. So in order to put it back together, we have to rethink what we want to do. Yes, it's so interesting that you say that. I was speaking to, to Blake Bowles. Do you know, are you familiar with his work? He just wrote a book called uh, Why Are You Still Sending Your Kids to School? He's a big proponent of self-directed education. And I think he used to teach at the camp that Grace Llewellyn started. She wrote the Teenage Liberation Handbook. Uh -huh. So I was speaking to him and, and saying, you know, wow, with the pandemic, you must really, your popularity must be increasing because a lot of people are looking for alternatives. And he said, no, actually not, that people feel that they are in such a kind of survival mode right now that they aren't, it's like parents don't have the bandwidth to start thinking about alternatives yet. But what my theory is that because the status quo and the, the normal habits of every day are being greatly disrupted by the pandemic and we're all having to invent new ways of doing things, that when we go back, It'll be like this, like, why are we doing it this way again? We don't need to do it like this. So I'm hoping that it's actually the students that will kind of refuse to submit to all the control and, and compliance activity that they were submitting to before and that that pressure will, and teachers, and that that pressure will cause disruption. I hope so. I think um, it's interesting. I think most parents are very worried about their kids in school. And the main thing they're worried about is that they're not learning the things that they should be learning for that grade level. And what I tried to do in a, in a lot of my blog posts, by the way, I write a blog post on wajway.com, W-O-J-W-A-Y, is to reassure parents that a lot of the things that kids are learning in school are memorization things, and they're going to forget it anyway. So if you just think about, you know, in, in the schools in the U.S., probably in Europe and in Africa and Asia and in America, uh, Latin America, you always have to take another language, you know. And so the U.S. does the worst job of it all, but um, other countries also, you know, they, they do a much better job. But still, if you take a language and you can take it for five or six years and learn it and then be able to speak it, I can tell you that after you graduate from whatever school, high school, college, and if you don't use that language for a few years, it's like you never took it. And so if it happens with the language where you spent all that time focused on memorizing and learning, can you imagine what happens with the rest of school? all those formulas that you memorize for chemistry, you know, all those names of biological parts, all the botanical things, the, all this memorization, it's just not there. And so what you want kids to learn to do is to think how to find that information because we all have a, an incredible library in our pocket. It's your phone. And if you know how to find what you need on your phone, you're way ahead. You don't have to memorize it. You just need to know how to find it. So um, I don't think parents should be as worried. They want to give their kids an overall look at what is, should be taught in that um, year. But then if they don't memorize everything, it's not a problem. They do need to know how to read. And um, so there's a, a website that I'm recommending that's free. It's called, um, is the Common, Common, Common Lit. And it's in Spanish and in English. And it's free and it does a great job of teaching kids how to read. 
So literacy, once you know how to read, then the world opens up for you. And then you can go online, actually, in many cases, and you can get free books. You don't have to buy them. You know, there's so many digital books online for free. And also, Google has this arts and culture website. I don't know if you've seen it. Arts and culture. You can take tours of museums all over the world, open and free. You can travel around the world on Google Earth. There's so much you can do. I think what I'm trying to do is tell parents, this is a year when we're educating differently, you know? And so it's not a problem. It's just different. And your kid is going to be just fine. So that's, that's the main thing. There's a, a popular New York Times bestseller called Educated. Have you heard about it? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. So it's a story of this girl. She's now a woman, and how she grew up in a very orthodox Mormon family. And they wouldn't let them learn to read. Girls were supposed to just become housewives, not be readers, not be thinkers. So she was really upset about it, and she and her siblings wanted to learn to read and to go to school. Anyway, she finally managed to be able to go to school. I think she was 13 or 14. And then they were pulling her in school and out, in and out of school all the time. She spent the first at least 15 years of her life not being able to do much of anything, but she had the passion to want to do it. Anyway, today she's got a PhD. So I don't want to make a very long story longer, but I'm just telling you, if your kid is oh, not learning something in one year, it's okay. They'll be fine. <laughs> I think that's going to provide tremendous relief to parents who are very worried this year. And I feel like there is this sense of, um, you know, like there's a documentary out called Race to Nowhere and that there's all this pressure on kids. Like you have to perform and you have to get the top grades and be a scholar athlete and get into a top school. And, and then they work, 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 and then get out, and then they continue to work, like 80-hour weeks, 90-hour weeks. Race to nowhere. That is right. I've seen that video or that movie, and it's nowhere. Yeah. So why are you doing that to yourself? Honestly, it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, so, I think I mean, people yeah, are, think like, afraid of, like, falling. You know, if there's this, like, bifurcation and, like, the wealth inequality, and parents are terrified that their, parent, that their children are not going to be able to sustain themselves or have health insurance or, you know, buy a home or put their own kids in college. I think there's a tremendous fear Correct. there. So let me tell you the most important skills that you need to have. There's a book called Everything You Needed to Learn or You Learned in Kindergarten. Have you heard of that book? Yes. Yeah. I think, uh-huh. They're Robert social something. emotional skills. I'm telling you, if adults there can be a genius graduating from Stanford with a 4.0. And if they can't work with other people, no one will hire them. So the social emotional skills are more important than anything. And those are the skills you parents can teach while your kid is at home now. And so that is something that they can just think about. They're all, you're all part of a team. It's called a family team. And you're all trying to help each other. I mean, I had my daughters folding diapers when they were little because I didn't have anybody to help me and I needed the diapers folded because that's what we did in those days, cloth diapers, can you believe? I used uh, cloth diapers too, voluntarily. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't oh, want to really? put those diapers in the earth. And they were expensive. They're expensive diapers. So I used oh, expensive. one set the, for two kids. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> diaper service and all this stuff or whatever it was. But I can just tell you, little kids can do more than you give them credit for. You sound and like a Montessori, a Montessorian. I am actually a Montessori for older kids. That's right. You can think about me that way. Montessori, kindergarten through 12th grade and college. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So have you, so I have an Acton Academy in El Salvador. Have you heard of Acton Academy? Yeah, I included it in my first book, the one that oh. I wrote, Moonshots in Education. Oh, I haven't read that one. 
Okay, great. I will that have to read it. That was the one that came out in 2015. Yeah. I thought Acting Academy was really great. I wish I could have gone to see it, but I just talked to people at the school, and then they sent me a lot of information. It was 2015, so the internet was not as good as it is today, but it was pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. And yeah, so yeah, I learned a lot. It's, it's a really great school. Thank you. Well, there are many now in California, so you could, uh, I'll find out the one closest to you and send you an email and maybe connect you so you can yeah, go you over could, and say I would hi. love to go and see, because I wanted to see it, but you know, Anyway, yeah, it's in that book. You got a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I have a lot going on. Yeah. It's good. You know, great. there's company tracked.app, and then, you know, I'm doing other things as well. I'm, I'm working with UC Berkeley on a tech, tech engineering school for graduates. So, but it's all based on the same philosophy empowering kids. Yes. You know, as opposed to having them sitting there like, you know, quiet little ducks in a row right listening to authority yeah. um, great well let's do let's talk about your latest book which is called how to raise successful people and in it you talk about the trick model for educators and parents will you tell us a little bit about that sure so the trick model trick is an acronym that i came up with came up with for helping teachers and parents and everybody understand what I thought was important in the classroom and in parenting. And I can tell you that it took me a while to come up with this acronym. And I had my students actually help me figure out what I was doing that seemed to work. So TRIC stands for Trust, Respect, Independence, Collaboration, and Kindness. And what my students said, because I, I used to say, why are you guys all taking this class? Because of an elective, right? Uh -huh. And everybody, they all wanted to take it. And why, what's so great about being in my class? And year after year, they said the same thing. And then finally, I believed it. They said, you trust us. And I said, well, I, you know, I didn't know what to say. Because I said, well, doesn't everybody? And they're like, nope, no one trusts us. <laughs> And so, so I realized after a few years that I was, a, you know, an isolated case there. And that was what drew a lot of kids. I trusted them, respected their ideas. I gave them a lot of independence. I mean, a lot. And then I collaborated with them on all rules. Everything connected with the classroom. I did the same thing with my daughters growing up. And then I treated them with kindness. And you don't learn to be kind unless you are treated with kindness. You need to understand what kindness is. So I don't think I ever sent a kid to the office in 40 years of teaching. I always talk to them. Can you imagine? That works. I can imagine. And, yeah, That's so hard for me. So and that is that, so Montessori. Trust the child. Follow the child. That's yeah, great. trust the child. Well, absolutely. And so what happens is when you trust the child, they then feel good about themselves, and then they trust themselves. Mm -hmm. They trust themselves. No, I can make my peanut butter sandwich myself, you know, or no, I can do the laundry and I'm going to, this is my clothes and I'm going to do it myself. I mean, there are courses now being given at a lot of universities called adulting and i just i just to tell you what's in the adulting class one of the things is like you know how to boil an egg yeah. <laughs> how to cook a little bit how to make coffee you know how to pour the cereal into your <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm not kidding. You see, Berkeley has a course in adulting. A lot of <laughs> universities have a course in adulting. It's because we don't te teach our children these things. We just, we don't trust them to do it. And it's like, oh, I can do it better. You know, I'm not going to let you pour your own cereal. You're going to make a mess all over the floor. I'll right. do it. Well, right. How are they supposed to learn to do it if you do it for them all the time? Exactly. When are they going to learn? And they can just. 
learn how to clean up the floor also when they spill a cereal on the floor. Yes, how to clean up the floor. People get dogs, and then I say, that's a great tool to teach yeah. kids responsibility. Let them feed the dog. You should see what happens. This woman called me up. She's like, dogs are just so much work. I can't believe that I got a dog. I said, who is taking care of the dog? <laughs> let's... Phil, let's figure that one out, you know, right. <laughs> feeding the dog, brushing the dog, walking the dog. So if you're doing it, the mother, well, you, you lost the purpose in getting the dog. Yes. You know, the child has to be in charge of the dog. And if the dog is hungry, the kid needs to know. Right. So anyway, yeah. So don't, don't make your child a candidate for the adulting class. <laughs> That kills me. I had no idea that there was a class called that. It sounds like a, you know, a joke, but it's not. I know, it sounds like a joke, but it's not. It's right. real. Wow. Okay. Well, I feel better about my parenting. Sometimes I think, though, like my parent, the reason I, I have fostered independence in my kids is because of my own laziness. Like I don't want, I don't want to go walk the dog or feed the dog. So I get, I think my laziness has been an asset in my parents. <laughs> I do think so. Actually parents be a little more lazy. Yeah. Lazier. It works. But have works. the kids do it. It yeah. makes them feel really good about themselves. It they sure talk does. to each other about it. You can hear, yeah. One of my grandkids knows how to make French bread. You know, we were busy not going to the store. Right. And so he went on YouTube. I kid you not. And went on YouTube, found some guy making French bread, followed him and followed the recipe. And now he's making French bread for the whole family. Oh, and they look fantastic. real. They're round. They're little round breads. And they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. You know, he needs to go into business now making French bread. <laughs> Marco's bread. That's great. We have at Acton, we do every year and, and children's business fair where kids learn how to make their own products and sell them. And right now is a big time where all the Actons around the world are doing those things for like a Christmas market. And so That's it's a great. great, yeah, it's a great opportunity and anyone can do it. It doesn't have to be Acton students. We open it up to everyone. And uh, it's just such a great experience to get that. Imagine a child doing 10 years in a row of the children's business fair, right. getting out and feeling like I already know how to be an entrepreneur. I know how to fail. I know how to sell. I know how to, you know, spend way too much money and not be able to pay back my parent investor because I made the wrong decisions. Those are all great things that you need, you know, that you need to learn when you get out into the real world. Right. So it's a great, it's a great, great experience. So, wow. So right now there is a, uh, so much. Yeah, I was going to ask you about helicopter parenting, but I feel like we just covered it with the adulting class. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's two different kinds of parenting that are both bad. Helicopter parenting, they hover, yeah. right? And now with the Zoom calls, you know, you have the perfect opportunity, your kids in the room doing their work, and you, the parent, are like, listening or watching. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's their work, yeah. not yours. So that's helicopter parenting, no, not a good idea. But the other one's called snowplow parenting. Have you heard of that? I have, I think, so. yes, I, where you they they like move clear the way. You don't have to worry about anything. It's just the way is cleared. Oh yes, dear, you can go out there. You know, there's already been cleared for you, no worries. And I say to these parents, well, you know, when they go off, when they're 18 years old, is the snowplow going with them? You know, <laughs> is, is that how they're going to cope in the world? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you need to need to realize that it really is it's counterproductive. I know it comes from a good place. You're trying to help and trying to be a good parent, but what it does is counter to what you're trying to do. You really need to let them do it. Yeah. And even if they put their clothes on backwards, let them wear them backwards. Definitely. Um, so I think we talked a little bit maybe before we started recording about how um, you and I had some similar parenting styles, like teaching our children to swim at a really young age, and that sometimes other parents would look at us like, are you weird? Like, what are you doing over there? And then also teachers wanting to be kind of following that status quo and being afraid to do something different. And I always think about Brene Brown 
in these, when I think about this, that um, when you choose to do something different because you, you know, you believe that it's the right thing to do, but you risk the sense of belonging in order to do it. And that can be very difficult. And it takes a lot of courage to go outside the norm to do something different. Um, and which is really like against the human nature. Have you, do you feel that you had to do that a lot? Yeah, so she's right. Brene Brown, I really admire her and I love what she's doing. Um, I can say that when you do something different, you are seen as an odd duck. And also you're making yourself vulnerable. And in that vulnerability, people can make fun of you and laugh at you and do all kinds of things. And so an innovation comes from taking a risk. So you cannot be innovative as long as you're unwilling to put yourself in this sort of vulnerable position. And people wonder, like, why are kids always following, you know, afraid to make a, a, any changes? A lot of kids are. And they are because they're afraid of what the teacher will say or afraid of what the school will say or they might be not, not be able to pass the test. Um, and so I think it's really important to realize that making change requires this vulnerability. And you should admire people who are willing to take a risk and come up with different ideas. It might not work, right? For sure. Yeah. But who knows? Maybe it will work. And as you mentioned about my daughter, um, or actually all three of my daughters learning to swim early because I have a swimming pool mm -hmm. and I didn't want to have a statistic. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to, um, I wanted to continue, you know, being a good mom and not worry about anything. I couldn't find anybody that was going to teach my one-year-old how to swim. Mm -hmm. Actually, she was 11 months old. And so what I did is I looked, went to the library back in those days. That's what you did. And I found this book called How to Teach Your Baby to Swim, Your yeah. Baby. I yes. thought, oh, this is like a right book for me. Yeah. And so I got that one out and I just like followed all the directions, literally followed the directions. It felt like recipe. Yeah. And sure enough, I mean, she was 12 months old or maybe even 11 and a half months old. And she learned to swim. It was incredible. And she was one of these very precocious kids that learned to do a lot of things early, like she walked at 11 months or 10 months. But then, interestingly enough, she also spoke. She could speak in sentences at the age of 13 months or something like that. It was shocking. And I remember we went to the swim and cl tennis club one day, and she was, you know, a toddler, 14 months old, walking along. And she jumped in the pool. And I can tell you, two adults jumped in after her. <laughs> it's like, we need to save this baby. And you weren't one of them. No, you I, was like, I was like, sorry, she knows how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> you scared the heck out of them. <laughs> they were like, I know, they were, sh they were, they thought they were doing the, you know, a, a very important deed for a lifetime. <laughs> so, Yeah. No, they can learn to swim early. They can learn to do a lot of things. Society says that they shouldn't do certain things at certain times, but in fact, they can do it. Yeah, they're greatly and, underestimated. Um, children. Right. I mean, I don't think it's... A, if your kid wants to learn to read early, you can help them. If they don't want to, don't force them. You know, the country that has the highest PISA test scores in the world is Finland, and the Finnish kids don't start school till they're seven. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm just trying to help all these parents, you know, relax. I love it. I love it. And so let's just circle back to the vulnerability a little bit. How did you deal with that? Like always being kind of an innovator and a little bit outside of the norm. Did you have like certain like self-care practices or do you just ha always have like a really you know, were you always just a really strong, emotionally strong person? Did you have well, a lot of I support? Think that, um, I've always, I've been, been a pretty emotionally strong person. I've set goals. I've always wanted to take care of people and help people. That's why I started out in journalism, because I wanted to be an a voice for people that didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So I could cover stories about people that 
you know, needed to be known, and they didn't have an opportunity to do that. And I started being a journalist very early. I was about 14, and I got a job, local job. Um, you know, I was, I, so I had a, a tragedy in my childhood that really made me say that education is the most important thing you can do for yourself or for anybody. Uh, so what it was is I had uh, I have two brothers, and one of them was uh, five years younger, and the other was eight, uh, eight years younger, seven years younger. And the youngest one was playing on the kitchen floor with a bottle of aspirin when he was about 18 months old. And my mother, being an immigrant, uh, didn't really know what to do, didn't know who to call. And so she called the doctor, and of course, the pediatrician, and he didn't answer the right way. He didn't listen, I'm clear. It was probably because she wasn't paying full price. You know, there must have been some reason. I can't imagine why. But anyway, he told her to put him to bed after he had eaten half a bottle of aspirin to see how he was in a, in a you know, few hours. Anyway, to make a very long story short, he died. And um, so that had a serious impact on me. And basically what it said was, don't believe people in power just because they have a long title after their name. You've got to find that information out yourself. And, you know, it was instinctive. It was embedded in me at that point, you know, because it, it was such a tragedy. I, I couldn't believe that somebody who was supposed to take care of you had done something like that. And um, so ever since then, I've been on this... I guess, you know, bandwagon to try to help people become educated and be able to take care of themselves and be able to, um, you know, lead lives that they want to lead and not, not have things happen to you when you have no control. But so I think that when I was changing the way I was teaching compared to other people, I was always thinking about those kids, you know, that they don't like to sit there and just listen and do nothing. You know, I, I'm here as a teacher because I want to help them, empower them, help them have a better life. And so that's what I'm going to do. And if I can't do it, well, then probably I should do something else. And so that's, I think, what, what motivated me. And, and to this day, that's what I. That's why I started this company, Track, to help kids learn how f fun it can be to learn, and to have information and to make decisions that matter. So, that's the story. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's a sad and very powerful story about you. You had yeah a, a visceral experience on why you need to seek your own counsel. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm definitely going to look into Tract for, for our kids. Um, here in El Salvador, we're still, the government still has us all learning on, from home. So it's been a long nine, almost 10 months now of not being together. It's very difficult. Any la like last question? And then, I just, and then I just have one more about metaphor. But uh, how would you tell kids nowadays that are stuck at home, teenagers particularly, to get their social needs met if they can't go out? FaceTime. I, I would let my kids be on Zoom calls together, FaceTime together, make TikTok videos together, gaming, you know, Roblox is a very social game. You know, um, Tract is also social. That's the goal. Um, you know, they need to be with their friends. And if they can't be with their friends in person, then they can be with their friends online. So I would just remember that as being important. No one likes to be alone. We're social beings. And um, so that's, that's the most important thing to remember. Nine months you've been, yes. almost, no. Yeah, almost since ten. February. Since March. March. Since March. Since March. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, we've been since March too, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. stuck at home. Yeah, because the, the public schools in California haven't gone back either, right? No. Yeah. The schools are not back, and the teachers are, nobody's back. We're all, 
And as you see, you can see what's going on in the United States. You know, we have 200,000 cases a day. Um, and California passed a million cases of uh, the virus, and so did Texas just now. So, wow, and they're still um, arguing over whether you should wear masks or not. <laughs> and they're still arguing over whether you should wear masks. Yeah. So I think that they need to rethink that. Um, well, I mean, if people want to die or want to get sick, I think, I don't know. I think we try to help them think, think it through. And if they really still want to, I guess we just have to let them do what they want to do. That's yeah. here in America. You know, that's the frontier spirit. Right. Which has but, its pluses. It has its but pluses. But we can see in this case where minuses. right, everything is a trade-off. Uh, <laughs> right. It's a trade-off. Oh, so, it has been so wonderful to talk to you. I feel like such kindred spirits. Um, so I love to um, use metaphor to explain this because I think it helps people to really visualize what we're talking about. If you could tell us a metaphor that you use for comparing traditional education with a more self-directed education, what metaphor would you come up with, Esther? I think it, I think the metaphor really is, you know, being able to drive a car. And if you can drive the car and read the map, you can get where you want to go. And if you're relying on somebody to be there to help you, to tell you what to do and to memorize, you'll never get there. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to travel the road independently and feel good about it and make decisions about whether to turn left or right because you have the knowledge and the information that you need to do it. I like that. Like, I'm thinking like, a train, like if you're on a train, you're only going to go to one de one destination. But if you can drive your car and know how to navigate, then you can go wherever you, you want go to go. Anywhere. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. So the world is open to you. And that. so that's, yeah, I think that, that would probably work for me. I always like driving places, actually. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, this has been so great. Well, I have really, really enjoyed talking with you, Esther, and I believe our audience has learned so much from you and will get that courage to be vulnerable and to do something different from our talk. And um, so all we're going to, of course, in our below the podcast, we're going to have all the links to all the many things that you have done um, to learn about your work. But what is the quickest way that our listeners could find you just getting off this podcast and going straight to you. Just go to www.wajway.com. W-O-J-W-A-Y, all one word. The reason it's Wajway, by the way, I should tell you. Yeah, tell us. You know, Wajitski, that's mm -hmm. a long name. And my students, they're like, you know, students, they never have enough time. They just didn't want to be bothered to say Wajitski, so they abbreviated it to Waj, W-O-J, and the whole school calls me Waj, and so does the city of Palo Alto, and people everywhere. <laughs> it's hilarious. So that's how I came up with Waj Way. And one of my emails is actually, hey, Waj. Aw, that's <laughs> nice. Well, I whenever someone has a nickname like that, it means they are truly beloved and truly belong to that community. So, Well, I think that might be true here. Yes, <laughs> Thank you very so. much. Oh. And thank you for including me on this. And I, I'm really impressed that you're in El Salvador. And I wish you all the best. And hopefully this pandemic will be over and then I can visit. I would <laughs> love that. Oh, I would take you all over and show you all the beautiful little hidden charms of this country. People are afraid to come here, but it really is a beautiful and place. And the people are very warm. And there's a lot of incredible flora and fauna and geological um, parts to see it's incredible so you're Great. more than invited <laughs> okay right. thank you Waj. incredible to spend this time with you take care bye take bye, care. bye. <laughs> thanks for listening to the new schools podcast tell a friend Previous episodes and show notes, including any books or websites our guests recommend, can be found at thenewschools.com. 
If you're a parent who is looking for a new school for your family, send us a message. We would love to help. We can answer questions, share the resources we have, and help you get in touch with people in your area who are on the same path, determined to provide their kids with the best education. It's wildly important work. Thank you for doing it. And we'll see you next time.